Every year in the United Kingdom, the Bradford International Film Festival features a widescreen weekend, four days dedicated to all things oblong in motion pictures. Screenings are held here at the National Media Museum, located in the centre of Bradford, West Yorkshire. The museum is a branch of Britain's Science Museum and is a government-funded body. Screenings are held in the museum's Pictureville Cinema, which is equipped to project a very wide range of film formats, including three-strip Cinerama, which was installed there in 1993. A variety of old and new films are shown during the festival, which also features lectures by guest speakers and other events of the wide variety. Each year, a presentation is made to an individual chosen for their outstanding contribution to the world of wide film presentation. As part of the 2012 event, which celebrated the 60th anniversary of Cinerama, three awards were made, one for each panel. Tom March, a Canadian Cinerama aficionado, was acknowledged for his enthusiasm and generous financial support of recent preservation efforts, and was one of the three to receive a scroll. Film historian Kevin Brownlow, famous particularly for his restoration of Abel Gance's 1927 epic Napoleon, with its climactic three-panel sequences, was also honoured. On Sunday morning, April 29, 2012, I was invited to say a few words about another guy well deserving of mention in the field of Cinerama preservation. Here is a recreation of that PowerPoint presentation, modified for general audiences with all the swear words left out. John Mitchell Sorry, make that John H. Mitchell. There are lots of other plain John Mitchell's around. What can I say about this man? A legend in his own mind. For a start, who is he? I'll tell you who John H. Mitchell is. John H. Mitchell is a, a very nice person. Yes, you heard me right. He is a first class, top of the range, very nice person of the first order. And we all hate him, don't we? Don't we? Why? Why? What, what do you mean, why? I'll tell you why. Because he's the guy who for the past 35 years has had a fully operational Cinerama set up in his back garden, with not just some, but all of the three strip titles released by Cinerama Inc. Yep, ten complete features plus trailers, reno ad, prologues and breakdown films. That's why he is a, what I said he is, ladies and gentlemen, because he has had all this for three and a half decades and we haven't. Life just isn't fair, is it? Envy, envy, envy. So what about this man we all hate with a vengeance? Who is he really, and where did he come from? John was born in suburban Sydney during the dark days of World War II. The only son of... Well, I've been enough already about John Bloomin' Mitchell. Let's talk about me.
My first full-time job in 1968 was as trainee assistant manager of Hoyt's Mighty Regent Theatre on George Street, Sydney's main thoroughfare. Here's the scene at that time. You'll note the Plaza Cinerama Theatre is just across the road. OK, the truth, I admit it. This photo has been faked. I have never, ever seen that many kangaroos in George Street all at one time. The Hoyt Sydney flagship Regent was the first cinema in Australia to install Cinemascope. Not all that surprising really, considering 20th Century Fox owned Hoyt Theatres Limited at the time. The Queen came to town in early 1954 while the robe was still playing. The first visit to this colony by a reigning monarch, so there was hoopla aplenty. Working at the Regent, I soon got to know the two projectionists and their assistants. The second operator, I was interested to learn, had spent several years at the plaza in the three-strip days. However, instead of waxing lyrical about the wonder of it all, I was somewhat deflated by his negative report of misery, spending hours alone in A or C booth with virtually nothing to do, running the same film over and over again, not able to see half the picture and getting no sound. Supreme boredom, he recalled. His assistant, on the other hand, a young fellow of my age, had not worked at the plaza, but was as enchanted by three-strip and widescreen as me, and we had many chats about our mutual interest. Ten years Years later, long after both he and I had left Hoyts, I was walking down George Street, just opposite the Regent in fact, when I was stunned to see a Cinerama logoed t-shirt approaching. It was my old assistant operator mate from the Regent. He enthusiastically imparted the news that there was a bloke in North Sydney who had the plaza's three-strip gear and was running Cinerama shows in his back garden. Excitedly, I obtained the telephone number of this fellow, at the time just plain John Mitchell was his name, and soon rang him. I was naturally keen to see his setup, and he, in his guarded, semi-disinterested way, invited me over to have a gander. That evening, at the appointed hour, I arrived, brimming with enthusiasm, to find a somewhat surprised John Mitchell. In my elation, I had overlooked the fact that although I had the time right, the invitation was for an evening later in the week. He showed me around anyway, and I returned a few nights later to view a demonstration reel, which consisted of the Best of Cinerama Overture, trailers for West, Grimm, and the Renault advert. It was so amazing to see Three Strip Cinerama again, after believing for twenty years that it had gone forever. John had first seen This Is Cinerama in 1959, before leaving to live in country areas. He did not get a chance to return until How the West Was Won, which was near the end of the plaza's three-strip period. In the late 1970s, John had gotten word from fellow film enthusiasts that Hoyts were about to vacate their warehouse store, the Ritz Cinema, in Sydney suburban Concord, which had ceased screening in 1960. It was here that the three-strip Cinerama prints, along with various projector parts, had been placed in storage ever since Single Strip had taken over at the Plaza in 1964. The soundtracks to all the travel films were there, but unfortunately the picture elements of most had been returned to Los Angeles for cutting up to create prints of the best of Cinerama. There was, however, a slightly damaged full print of This Is Cinerama, which was apparently used for training purposes at the Plaza. Highlight of the collection was four full prints of How the West Was Won, which had been used in Sydney and Melbourne. Two prints of each title were always supplied. Unfortunately, these had all been water damaged through having been stored under the stage at Concord in an area prone to drainage problems. These enthusiasts obtained the soundtracks from Hoyts, but then needed someone to transfer them to tape for home listening. John H. Mitchell, being a sound man, was just the man for the job. In return for his labours, he was presented with all the materials. Having these soundtracks inspired John to seek out the picture and projection elements to go with them. He was particularly keen, having missed seeing most of the titles when they were originally shown at the plaza. In the 1960s, 
1960s, Hoyts had given Cinerama Inc. the opportunity to reclaim what was in fact their projection equipment. Why would a virtually bankrupt company bother paying freight to retrieve gear that was now obsolete? So it stayed. Hoyts gradually disposed of the unclaimed three-strip bits and pieces. A lamp house ended up showing advertising slides at a Melbourne drive-in, and projection parts companies got hold of various items. John obtained a few heads from one dealer just before he was to convert them back to four perf movements. Still short of vital elements, John looked to the Plaza Theatre, which had ceased screening and was sold by Hoyts, the auditorium first became a 24-hour restaurant, Naxi's. John heard that the operators wanted to pull out one of the remaining projectors to put on display in the foyer. He offered his services to do the job and obtained a few needed parts. It emerged that B Machine had long ago been removed and replaced by a 70mm projector to experiment with platters. But when they vacated the building, Hoyts had left A and C booths untouched, by then having no use for the contents. The restaurant soon folded and the floor was flattened to create a roller skating rink. This also required the removal of the side projection booths, which jutted out from the walls. Knowing that the final C booth machine was still in place, John fronted up to the foreman in charge of demolition. What's it worth? the man inquired. Oh, maybe fifty bucks, said John. Well, if that's all, take it for nothing. Just have it out of the building by Monday. And that machine took pride of place running B-Panel at John's thereafter. Thirty years ago, on a visit to a Los Angeles junkyard, John found a few Cinerama spools. Too bad he didn't have room for that blimp in his suitcase. From various collectors and contacts around the world, John eventually built up the virtually complete inventory of three-strip titles we are so envious of. By the time I met John, he had reduced his screening frequency to two or three a year, always on a Saturday night, so as not to overly disturb the neighbours with horrific late-night sounds like buffalo stampedes and spectacular train wrecks in seven-track hi-fi cinerama sound. As I was working in cinemas every Saturday night, this posed a bit of a problem. However, my main concern was about deciding, with the opportunity now available, whether to actually attend these screenings or not. Like so many of you, I had been blown away as an impressionable young lad by the whole three-strip theatrical experience and savoured the memories of my visits to the plaza in the early 60s. Would viewing these fabulous films again, 20 years later, now with faded prints on a smaller, flatter screen, actually ruin my fond remembrance of those wonderful days long past? A quandary. So, for both these reasons, I didn't actually attend any of John's screenings for the next ten years or so, and John and I lost touch, partly too because John is slow to warm to people. Anyway, at this point I must confess another interest, apart from Cinerama, and that is the architecture of old cinema buildings, city, suburban, and particularly palatial country edifices like this. On one of my expeditions around New South Wales in search of the unusual, I happened upon an interesting-looking structure up a side street in a small, quiet country town 400 kilometres northwest of Sydney. This abandoned and overgrown venue was a rare surviving example of an outdoor-indoor twin cinema, common in the days before air conditioning, particularly in hot country areas. I took some video scenes of the Corindai Royal building and determined to return at a later date with my still camera for more shots of this interesting relic. A few months later I arrived in town on a sleepy Sunday afternoon, only to find my abandoned relic to be a hive of activity. Outside an electrician was attaching power to the building. I asked to see the man in charge for permission to take some photos, and who should this be but our old friend John H. Mitchell. It turns out his lifetime desire to operate his own cinema had finally come good. Cut to ten years later, and here are John and his offsider Gordon, admiring a new book documenting their years of labour restoring the theatre's grandeur, along with the full 100-year history of the place. 
This is a marvellous, engrossing, and thoroughly enjoyable book. Modesty prevents me from naming the person what wrote it. For the benefit of non-British persons present, that was a deliberate misuse of language for comic effect. I am related to Eric Morecambe. I know, I should keep my day job. But that was all in the future. Way back 60 years ago, young John had been fascinated by projection equipment from an early age. By the time he reached high school, he was operating the classroom 16mm machine, and by age 14, he had a 35mm powers projector at home. He managed to beg, borrow or buy various 35mm shorts and other pieces of film to run, with sound, of course. His favourite clip in the collection was this local newsreel item containing a roller coaster ride at Sydney's Lunar Park. Could this be the portent of an interest to come, one wonders? Looks strangely familiar, doesn't it? Except for that bridge. The first cinema John remembers visiting for Saturday matinees was the suburban Chatswood Esquire. It was here, too, that he got his first look inside a projection room. A few years later, it was here at the Gordon King's that he had his first full-time job. It was as assistant operator. The Gordon Theatre was a typical barn-like two-floor suburban cinema, like scores built in the 20s and 30s. He wasn't here long before getting a full-time job at a TV station, which were all starting up transmission at the end of 1956. After his TV stint, John was back projecting full-time, now at the Rose Bay Winter Garden, later home of the Sydney Film Festival for many years. Here it is about to be knocked down, like most cinemas of its era. A few years later, in 1960, it was off to live in the country for a while. Here he is at home in the Southern Highlands, with some early pieces of what would turn out to be a spectacularly large collection of projection and other related equipment. Part-time work beckoned at the local empire in Bowral, still operating, by the way, as a multiplex. Then it was off to Wollongong, south of Sydney, where he did some casual operating at a couple of drive-ins. Then, from 1964, it was a full-time career with the telephone company in Wollongong, and a transfer back to Sydney. Some of that supposedly telephonic equipment next to his desk looks a bit cinematic to me. And those windows in the laboratory where he worked looked a bit mm, projection porthole-ish, don't you think? Lunchtime office entertainment was on a grand scale in 16 and 35mm for his fellow employees. It was while working here that John dreamed of a real cinema of his own. And when workmate Gordon mentioned a derelict country cinema he had seen for sale, John took an interest. Here it is in 1989 when John bought it. The for sale sign is still on the front wall. A sad and sorry spectacle which required years of work. John and Gordon drove up every fortnight for seven years to do a three-day weekend of hard toil, followed by ten years of actually screening every second weekend. Although specialists were brought in for certain jobs, John and Gordon handled most of the myriad of tasks themselves. Finally, opening day came, but even then, the work never stops. John used Ernemans, which were originally installed in the Sydney Opera House. The right side machine could also run 16mm. Naturally, John was able to present a wide variety of formats, and even test ran 70mm on a DP70 there. The 1930 proscenium was so wide it comfortably handled scope with room to spare. Yes, John had a vast range of projectors on display down the auditorium sides, and a bunch of Cinerama trunks were kept in that right-hand corner. With the auditorium up and running, John and Gordon looked to reactivate the outdoor garden section. This is the original screen. Silent films filled it. Rather than going to the expense of buying new lenses, it was masked down for sound, which came from the protective box above the screen. After years of dilapidation, all that was left when John arrived were the two posts which originally held the screen up. Rather than erect a new screen, John decided to use the rear wall of the auditorium. Here are the boys painting it. A problem, though. How does a big screen man fit a scope picture into a restricted triangulated area? 
Fifty years ago, my family holidayed in the Twin Cities of Woy. I attended the local Etlong Beach Cinema there, of course. They handled the introduction of scope at this venue in a unique way. Instead of reducing the height of the picture, they put in a full-width screen and just allowed the sloping roof to clip off the top corners of the picture. I think they had to add extra cue marks to cope. Lopping off corners would of course be sacrilege to a true wide screener, so John came up with a creative solution, retractable wings on the roof, to give the picture that added dimension. He seems to think he's some kind of king of the world now, or something. On opening day of the open air opening night, volunteers help clean the floor. For open-air screenings, John provided plastic chairs. Some patrons bought their own or just sat on the grass or on bean bags. And the initial scope attraction took full advantage of the extra screen space available. This picture is of a man with some large metal balls. In 1993, on his way here to Bradford, John stopped over in Moscow. He was interested in this cannon, which looks bigger than the one at Edinburgh Castle, featured in This Is Cinerama. Naturally, he went to check out the Mir three-strip theatre, which was then still screening, but only in 35 and 70, using projectors which look mighty like DP-70s, but aren't. The Krugovaya Circular Kino Panorama Theatre in Moscow was still running, with an all-girl crew ever since it opened. Here is the console. If you thought three was a lot, try 22, or even just 11. I'll just pause here to point out for Thomas Howerslev's benefit that John has found a few DP-70s on his travels. This one was in the Cinerama Theatre, Christchurch, New Zealand. But back to Kino Panorama. Upon returning from Moscow and Bradford in 1993, John was initially pleased with the opportunity to get involved in the resurrection of three-strip production on his very doorstep. For anyone embarking on six-perf filming in Sydney, John would be a very good person to be on side with, as he has the only facilities in the Southern Hemisphere where that photographed material can be shown. It was produced by then Sydney resident John Stephen Lasher, who bought over a couple of Russian camera experts, along with the three-strip camera he purchased in Moscow. Lasher was originally a Cinerama enthusiast, but soon changed his allegiance to the Russian system. I don't know whether he ever became a commie, but he certainly adopted some Soviet-style techniques. Unfortunately, John Mitchell has a low tolerance level. He and Lasher had an inevitable falling out, and he has since been airbrushed from history, persona non grata, in the fantasy world of Kino Panorama Land. Here he is above left, operating in camera in a three-panel view, and below, a still other scene, with join lines and John Mitchell removed by Mr. Kino Panorama's photoshopper. John McLean, who you saw in the last photo, was a clapper loader on South Seas Adventure. Quite a few people worked on both Cinerama and Cinemiracle in the 1950s, but he would be the only person in the world who has shot in both Cinerama and Kino Panorama. Many enthusiasts have made the pilgrimage to John Mitchell's place over time, and he has been pleased to run something when the interest was there. Just over 20 years ago, John arranged a special screening for surviving local cast members of South Sea's Adventure, whose numbers, even then, were thinning. A Kiwi couple from the film came over, and there are four thirsty Bondi lifesavers on the left. Hans Farkash, seated centre, would have loved to have been here this weekend. Margaret Roberts, seated right, was also in in the Outback sequence, filmed mainly at the Sydney Pagewood studio. Many of you will know of Bob Gaskin, not well when last I heard, who visited John's place on many occasions and helped John obtain a lot of his Cinerama prints. Twenty years ago, a couple of Norwegians arrived for a winter screening and rugged up on bean bags for a viewing of Windjammer. The visit was later recreated in a TV documentary. This is Kel Ball, the original console operator at the Sydney Plaza. He helped Frank Richmond install the equipment. This film cleaning device was used at the plaza to wax the soundtrack to reduce oxide loss. And of course, 10 years ago, 94-year-old Otto Lang came specifically from Seattle to see again the Cinerama film he directed. That's an original 24-sheeter on my living room wall, by the way.
The fact that John has the soundtracks for all the three strip titles and the equipment to play and duplicate them has meant he has been a natural go-to man for any Cinerama sound copying requirements. He provided a new Seven Wonders English language soundtrack, for example, to John Harvey for screenings at the Dayton New Neon. John even did a replacement soundtrack of Windjammer for Cinerama Inc. themselves, as theirs had gone off. The only compensation he ever received for these services was in the form of additional mag stock, so that he could re-record the rotting originals before the dreaded vinegar syndrome took a firm hold. John donated a new English language soundtrack to Bradford for the Renault commercial, which I believe had to be endured in French for its early screenings here. There was talk at one stage of John doing an English language version of Windjammer for Pictureville, but there were some problems related to this museum, funds and the total absence of you'll be surprised to hear. To Seattle he loaned his print of Windjammer and Search for Paradise and also arranged for Search for Paradise to be sent on here to Bradford for screening at the widescreen weekend in 2003. He lent a Brothers Grimm three-strip trailer to John Harvey, where is it now, I wonder? And two years ago, he provided the final missing scenes from How the West Was Won to the museum here so you could fully enjoy every drop of that bloody, gory violence that occurs at the pirate camp. For Dave Stramar's Cinerama adventure and the digital restoration of the features, John had provided various shorts, newsreels, prologues, clips, breakdown films and other elements. He has also agreed to do sound transfer work for Dave on the new Super Cinerama production in the picture, currently being made in Los Angeles by what some twerp describes as a bunch of amateurs. Cinerama has been brought back to life to be enjoyed by a new and what's left of an older generation. So so that, ladies and gentlemen, is the John H. Mitchell story, a lifetime interest in the nuts and bolts of projectors which has developed into a decades-long passion for keeping alive the three-strip era, which, twenty years ago, many of us thought was simply gone forever. John H. Mitchell, this is your life. Oh, sorry, he doesn't feel well enough to travel here at the moment, not just because he's a Woody Allen fan. So he thanks the Board of Governors and hopes the Academy will accept the Oscar on his behalf. Thank you for your attention. Following me on stage was widescreen weekend consultant Bill Lawrence, who made a formal presentation to John in Sydney live via Skype. This is some of what he said. There were many people who made this 60th anniversary of Cinerama celebration at the widescreen weekend in Bradford a success, but the contribution made by one man was particularly exceptional. When the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television was planning to build its new cinema and recreate a Cinerama experience for new audiences, we relied on John Harvey and Willem Boomeister. But we knew that on the other side of the globe there was another very special individual who was already maintaining the flame and keeping Cinerama in the public eye. Over the years, John has helped many people. When the museum needed a new soundtrack for How the West Was Won, he happily copied his print and sent it over. He lent prints for the 50th anniversary and this year provided great support with prints of The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm South Sea's Adventure and How the West Was Won. No one who was there will forget it, and no one should forget John H. Mitchell for making it happen and the years of dedication in preserving Cinerama as a living exhibit. A few weeks later, a young lady who attended Bradford paid a visit to John in his Sydney back garden. Ramin, all the way from Bora Bora, presented John with his widescreen weekend award in recognition of his contribution to the preservation and present day enjoyment of this antique motion picture experience. John Howard Mitchell, on behalf of Cinerama fans worldwide, we salute you.